turn the sound up. I hope this doesn't blow your ears out, but <clears throat> okay. And here we go. I just have a couple of, they, they, they have really long ones and then they have small ones and then they have a whole bunch of different languages, but here we go. We are now in Casa Morandi, and this is the place where Giorgio Morandi lived with the three sisters from 1910 to 1964 when he died. Morandi has this kind of mythology, the fact that he was retired in this place for the most part of his life and working here at the studio most of the time and teaching at the academy, which is very, very close to here. He never went away from Bologna for many years. He went just in Florence, in uh, Rome, in Venice for the Biennale. But he never went to Paris or to other places. So it was, in a way, a strange way of living, but uh, very important for the production, for this idea of focusing on the object. The magic part was moving in the workshop, moving around this object and find uh, the, the right one and find your, the, the shape he was looking for and then finding a right balance in between the object and the light, the shadow of the object on the other object. And this kind of dance of making a relationship in between the painter, the artist and the object of the painting to find the perfect balance and the perfect stage. When the set was ready, when the light was perfect, for the painting was just a very quick thing, like finishing the process. This kind of approach was putting the role of the artist as central. The idea of focusing on the process of making and not on the final result is why Morandi is still so important for contemporary art. Well, did you hear that? So the process of making, it was even probably more important than the finished product. And he would agonize over where to put things and how to how to go about it because he's I mean, really looking for this personal way of seeing look at it he's painting he's painting all of his still life objects <laughs> so the composition was the important thing for him and and yeah in his way of composing you know, it made a personal, a personal way of composing. This isn't, not classicism at all. He, he's, I mean, not, not to say he doesn't have, uh, there's not classicism influencing it, but really coming up with, trying to come up with his own language. That's not easy. But isn't that interesting how he paints the uh, objects? Because he's got to get them in the right, the right color and value, you know, so they catch the light, right? So. <laughs> Most of objects are uh, common objects. It's not important what they are and if they are precious or not. The physical shape and the volume itself, like uh, if they were characters of a drama or on a stage, that was important for Morandi. Morandi was looking at Cezanne. When you see the landscapes, the use of color was a lot influenced by this use of very flat colors. In every Morandi work, there is no light, and the houses of the landscape are without windows. The flowers were silk or dry flowers. The palette used just some kind of colors, pastel colors. So there is this absence of life in a way, this idea of fixing a moment. Morandi is an artist to discover. His way of making art is a key moment for the development of the Italian and international history of art of the 20th and 21st century. And the idea of shifting from the final result to the process is real modern, real contemporary, and for me, the most important part of the Morandi production. With flexible, royalty-free plans, mix and match your assets. Try free for 30 days with Adobe Stock.
Here are... If you look I mean, close... Look at his color. It's just, it's unusual and, and personal. This is what happens when an artist, you know, really concentrates on what they're into and what they're, and really reduces it down to just what the artist wants and nothing else. It's hard. It's hard leaving out the stuff you don't want. And, and, and leaving in the stuff you do want. But look at these, look at this really pale sort of light, airy color theme here. Really interesting. He is a collector's um, artist too. He's not a, you know, he wouldn't be, he is a big name, no question. But most artists know about Morandi, but <clears throat> he has nothing like a um, a Picasso or something. Like he's much more. I don't know. You you find you you find Morandi. Two of the objects in our photo are in this painting. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. So he cheated, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you look closely. What was that? Oh, okay. At Giorgio Morandi's Again, paintings. A totally different color theme in that one, huh? I mean, I always think of him as doing these really light things like this. But he does look at these heavy things. I, yes. on, I have a comment on that last painting you were just showing, the light one. Yeah. Um, the shadow is right there. The light is coming from the left because you can see the shadows. Yeah. However, the two cups or bowl or whatever, the shadow is on the left. And, and it just seems wrong, I guess, to me that the shadow should be on the right. The shadow. Oh, you mean in the inside? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's inside. So it scoops inward. So then that casts a shadow down here. And this side scoops the other way and catches the light okay maybe that's it yeah. it's a bowl it's concave so yeah it, it is it's a little so it's it's not round like the i mean it's 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 not um uh, round like the outside is it's doing the reverse right it scoops inward so you're going to get a shadow in here a shadow okay. over here yeah i know it's a little weird it's weird painting it too when you're going when you, when you paint that type of thing, you're going to run. What? What's going on here? Okay. Profound and stimulating than one might wow, initially expect. His total attentiveness to still life, which he brings to the precipice of abstraction. That's just another thing, right? He, he never did. I mean, there's other things he's done, like you saw the landscape, but he's really focused on this land on still life. He just... Uh, He's an artist to look at for, he had this thing he did that he wanted to contribute, you know, into the world of art. And he did it over and over and over to the point of, you know, he could just fill rooms full of these things. The, the thing is, is that you get, because of the repetition, because he just does it relentlessly. He he gets his point across, that visual point. You could talk about it with words. I try to. I'm not really great, but he he gets his point across. So let, let's see it. Is nothing short of astonishing. Is that it? Oh. Is it all short? Giorgio Morandi rarely left Bologna. Living in the same house his entire life with his three unmarried sisters. He never traveled abroad apart from a single trip to Switzerland in 1956. 
He never visited Paris like other painters of his generation. And he never looked further than the view from his modest studios in Bologna and Grizzana for subject matter. One can travel this world and see nothing. To achieve understanding it, it is necessary not to see many things, but to look hard at what you do see. Mirandi is best known for his still life paintings of the same selection of familiar items. These objects are bereft of domestic purpose and instead become sculptural forms that invite meditation and contemplation. While superficially Mirandi's paintings may look similar, they are full of small, sensitive shifts and inflections, dependent on precisely which objects are placed where, in what combination, in which colors, and under what light. Mirandi painted this still life in 1943. That summer, the Italian government deposed and imprisoned Mussolini, and Italy signed a secret armistice with the Allies, who had already invaded the Italian mainland. Mirandi had friends involved with the resistance, and when a postcard from the artist was found in the possession of a friend who had been arrested for anti-fascist activity, agents of the secret police appeared at Mirandi's door during the afternoon of the 23rd of May, 1943, and took him off to prison. Because he was an esteemed professor of art at the University of Bologna, friends with connections high in the Ministry of Education managed to obtain his release within days. Bologna, a major artery of military transportation, endured severe Allied bombing. For the remainder of the war, Morandi sought safety in Grizzana. There may be some hint of the painter's uneasy state of mind in the slightly off-center composition of the present still life, or in his decision to station two vases, like sentinels, guarding a vulnerable open bowl. Yet it's difficult to identify obvious signs of the war in the familiar elements of Mirandi's still life paintings, except by way of contrast. These paintings, with their humble and unassuming humanity, so silent and contemplative, appear to be far removed from the daily experience of violence, chaos, and death shattering the world around them. And you know, let me let me uh, really. okay. Look at these uh, etchings as, as well. I mean, might as well. They're just. I don't know, they're so full of character. They're so personal. You notice how I think he works only by window light. I don't think he used a light. It feels like window light in that studio. I don't know if they really mentioned that, but you can tell by his uh, really diffused shadows. Like, let's just take this one. The really soft edges on the shadows. Feels like window light. It would be like him just, just to keep it as pure as possible, from what I understand. But look at him, he just over and over and over again. You know, you usually in composition, we, we say steer clear of repetition. But he's doing this little dance with it. So, you know, it's almost like saying, he's saying, how much can I get away with before it's off, before it's ridiculous? And they're, they're, sometimes they're almost, but he saves it somehow. 
I mean, you got a tangent here. You got tangents all over the place. He's playing with every rule that, that they always say. Like a tangent is when you don't overlap <clears throat> very clearly. And a lot of his things are not quite overlapped very clearly, but he gets enough, let's say like in this one over here, he gets enough dark behind it to where it's fine. And then look at this, the edge of this lines right up with the side of this. You know, the, the top of this, these are things you just don't do in composition. And yet he, he teeters with them. He's looking for where is that fine line? And he's, he's quite, I don't know, obsessed, but uh, he's certainly into that idea. Totally, this, these are the kind of colors that I, I, when I, I, upon review, I wasn't expecting to see. I'm, I'm most of the time expecting to see this type of thing or maybe even this. But when you get into like a lot of contrast like this, I, I almost chose this one. But um, I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe next time, I don't know, but Mirandi isn't quite known for this palette so much. It's, it's more of a more, a more contrast a palette he's and i thought i'd just do what more what he's known for which is something like that how about that though huh it's this is modern art though you, you know when you when you shift <clears throat> from more traditional art to more modern art then oh look at this oh, pretty pretty darn nice so when you when you shift, you just have to consider that, you know, let's say this is probably more of his um, academic days. He's at the academy, maybe going to school. The reason I say that is just because it's he's younger, <laughs> but um, it's got really classic sense of light and shadow on it. It's interesting how his, his palette really isn't that much different. I mean, in other words, the colors he uses. Really interesting. Wow. Okay, so. Oh, look at this landscape there. Probably just a small thing, huh? Hmm. I bet you he painted that right out of his window of his studio, huh? Oh, well, I'm not going to put my name in there, so. Okay. Let's get into it. <laughs> I could just look and look and look at those. The, the way he plays with all of the things you're supposed to avoid and in, in, in painting, <clears throat> that's what's interesting to me because I like to see how far you can push it. Like let's say a tangent or overlapping, let's say, or repetition or even um, very symmetrical painting. So really interesting, okay. Well, I, I noticed in our photo reference, the vase is right in the center. Right. Right. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that. You know, typically, let's see, where, where am I? I'll just draw it up. I'll draw it right here. Let me zoom in. Typically, you, you'll want, and you start off with something like the rule of thirds. And so, okay. why these computers? 
you redid my whole desktop. Okay. So it's typically what you don't want to do is throw everything in the center. That that's the, this rule of thirds is to keep you out of the center. And Morandi says, "No, no, no. I, I'm gonna I want to see it in the center." But what I'm gonna do is let's just take this. Do 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 do. Okay. And yeah, right, right. we've got this cup right in front of it. That's a big no-no in, in academic sort of composition. He knows this. I mean, he's a professor at the academy. No, no. why is it a no-no? Well, typically you want to avoid symmetry. And the first thing he does is do the most symmetrical thing you can take take a big a big uh, a big vertical right in the center of the piece and then put a cup of dead center right right in front of it uh. i mean he's he's going for it but but what he does here is he offsets that by this piece over here this smaller one so he doesn't go totally symmetrical And 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 then over here, we, I, I'm sure he agonized over how far to put this broken cup. <laughs> how how close to put it next to to get that shape, that negative shape in between, that dark shape in between the two. He's he's toying with composition. little bit of an overlap here very little almost i can get that up a little, a little higher huh? and then come over here and he's got this oh, i bit did that a little large huh not that big He's got something going on. I mean, even these strokes in the background, this going this way, this going this way, being a little darker here, a little lighter over here. He's he is very conscious of these things. And look how he has the the, the background line here, right at the top of this cup. Again, the things you don't you don't usually do. Even the front of this being. Really good place to put his name. Um, so he's a composer and he's doing things that really, I mean, Degas did, the, Degas did quite a bit of this too. I mean, so Degas way before him. It, it's not like artists weren't playing with this stuff, but whoa, he he makes a point of it and develops his own little language. Again, you know, you, you do that over and over and over, you're going to... You're going to make your point. Got this back there, got this. There. Rob, it looks yeah. to me like what he did with making the corner of the room behind and yeah. you know to the right of the bus yeah is was a really important I know tactical uh, thing he did because yeah that, was. that pulled the if that wasn't there then the painting would just feel still very symmetrical and and oh, yeah. a bit uncomfortable with how centered the vase is but the that mm -hmm. pulls the vase over it pulls it over and yeah, it puts does. more weight to the right so I, wow it's just so interesting how he put that in there 
I know he's just shifting things all over the place. He's there's some there's a cast shadow from this Maybe back here all the way over here, and then he carries it right out. So, and you're right. I mean, even though it looks not as meticulously done as let's say a baroque still life or something like that uh he's he's i'm sure he's watching us right now watching every little thing you do <laughs> he's like no 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 <laughs> okay you're cupping morandi okay so i'm going to take some a middle value back here. Let's get that dark enough because I know it's. See that that's out of key really the darkest thing in there would be the red probably on me as far as a value key goes i really wouldn't want to go any darker than that really except for maybe this red so sometimes it's a good idea in the beginning just to hit your darkest value knowing that, that now you can make sure that none of your other values get quite that dark. Oh boy, I don't wanna get it too dark. Right, and then I could have pulled this value and it's, a little bit darker. Oh boy, that's really dark. I'm gonna fade that out here. And this over here, much lighter. Well, not much lighter, but a little bit lighter on this wall. I can't imagine what a class with him as a teacher would be like. He'd be like, no, 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 move it over here just slightly. Yeah. Do you see the difference? Very important. Yeah, Ver Vern Wilson was the one who turned me on to Mirandi. He was one of my teachers and and quite an amazing composer in himself just totally absorbed into all of these artists it was so great going in a studio you could just you had a big library and you could just sit in there and read sometimes i would i'd come to class i mean he had he had his own classes all, along with um art center classes but i come to his personal classes and instead of working i just sit in there and read you know, his studio was right over here in eagle rock and it's still there i don't know what they did with it, it it's just this little 
I know some artists bought it. And then I don't know what's going on with it now. I used to be such a hub though. Did anyone used to go to that? No, back in the day. I had walked away and I didn't, I don't, I didn't hear you who you're talking about. Oh, did you go to, did you ever go to Vern Wilson's uh, studio? I don't think oh, so. no. It was a little, little bit before. Yeah. Because I don't, I think he sold that back in the early 90s. Yeah, I was still Steve, working. Yeah, Steve Houston took it over for a while and then they shared it with a sculptor and then, I don't know if they, maybe they still does, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I know Steve Houston lives in Montana, so I'm pretty sure he doesn't. I wonder if the sculptor still does. Okay, so, right, so right, we have this. Okay. And we have these darker values in here. Ah. Down and down and then there. Don't want to get those too dark. So anyway, I think we're understanding that the values in this thing are just really, really crucial. It's it's not an incredibly colorful thing, but it's you know, if anything, he's known for the subtlety, right? I think you're grasping that. Just really subtle things. I'll let that dry up a little bit before I put the shadow on it. And this one here, a very light shadow. And some of these little things. And then here, this cup. Again, a very light shadow on this cup. And the reason it's a little darker inside the cup is because the shadow's right there. It's being cast right by the lip of the cup onto the inside. Same in here. Might as well do that one too. Same in here. And then I'll do these ones. I'll come back and throw a shadow on that in a second. This little, little, very light shadow on here. All right, a couple of these little, okay. A little bit of shadow on there, I think that's pretty good. So, you no, know, it's, it's a pretty light painting in general. And not the most incredibly colorful painting. Let's try it again. But it's really subtle color. It's almost like if, if he's after anything, he's after subtlety. Subtle shifts. I just split that down the center and then maybe the table's about, you know, if you come to the center here, well, the table is way down here. I think it kind of goes up a little bit. Get this in the middle, this little lip right there, um, a cast shadow from something. And then this, I'll start it about that far, maybe that that far from the side. Um, I could have given that a little more room. Okay. Yeah, the one thing about this artist is that it, it's it's hard not to get caught up into his subtlety, and then you'll be like, no, 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 I gotta move it up. No. <laughs> and then an hour goes by.
Just touches it. A little higher though, maybe more up there. Yeah, it's right on the very top of this, this line right here. Is this like a mold for a Macron or something? I don't know what this thing is. I'm getting hungry though. Okay. <laughs> I should put that up a little higher, I think, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm I'm getting too obsessed with this. I just want I just want color. Oh boy, they are obsessive. Okay, they're they're obsessive pieces. They're, but but think about it. I mean, you can obsess about a lot of things. When art, anything artistic, is such a great thing to completely lose yourself in. Okay, let's Oh, so we've got this, I would say kind of a green gray in the background. So, uh, you can make a green and maybe ultramarine blue because it'll gray the blue. It'll gray your green a little bit. And then ultramarine blue and lemon yellow and then cad red. How green is that? It's not far off. See, will it be dark enough though? And I didn't make enough, right? So, in the cat red should gray it enough. Oh boy, is this gonna to be too red? Yeah, a little bit. A little bit more yellow, a little bit more blue. So I just used red, yellow, and blue. Cad red, I'm sorry, lemon yellow, cad red, and ultramarine blue. Mix them all together. I use plenty. Maybe even a little bit yellower than that, yeah. And then over here, lighter. At least on the wall, it's lighter on the ground. It's about it's about the same value as all this over here. But let's see, yeah, this a little bit at the base there. All right, and then we've got this and and that.
but the shadows actually on, let's say the vase here, look lavender to me. A lavender gray. So again, uh, I would take ultramarine blue. You know, I think of a, a cad red, because that'll give you a grayer lavender, and that's something you probably want. And then some yellow in that will gray it. I got a little white in this. And that would that's what I should have done in the background there. Maybe probably should have put a little white in there. Accidentally got a little white in there, and I like it. So to see, it almost feels a little bit redder than the background. Well, he he does create that dark from the background right along this edge here. I didn't see that. We'll have to play with that. And there's going to be a lot of discoveries in this thing. <laughs> it's pretty much the same color shadow on here. He does get in here, he gets lighter. The color of the light on the table is, it's a lot like this, but just lighter. Which now means, do I darken that or? <laughs> I don't want to get too obsessed with the values right now. We'll do that in the finish. And oh boy, are we going to obsess? <laughs> no, but uh, here's something that'd be, that's interesting. Uh, a kind of pasty yellow here. And it's not a, I wouldn't call that a yellow right out of the tube. None of these are. The, everything he does is so complex. So I'm going to take the red, yellow, and blue, and then about 95% yellow. And if you like, maybe add a little white to that. I'm coming up with a color. Like that. Maybe a little touch yellow. I'm just going to put the yellow down first. Could be just slightly yellower. That's lemon. Did I say cad red? I meant lemon, lemon yellow, cad red, ultramarine blue. The bottom is this pasty blue. He's doing the same thing. It's the same three colors, but then he dominates it with blue. Red, yellow, blue. I'll say the same, um, cad red, lemon yellow, ultramarine blue, and then let's really lighten that thing. Oh, it's, it's in this area. Very light. I mean, his, his work almost looks gray. And then you're looking, I know it's yellow grays, red grays, blue grays, they're all over. He does put a pretty strong red in here though, but again, it's not, it's the same three colors. It wouldn't surprise me if he used four colors on a lot of paintings. Um, the cad red, I'm gonna go with lemon yellow and ultramarine blue. That'll make more of a, like a terracotta color. And look how subtle he, he works it. Can you see that it's a little lighter over here and then it goes into shadow? 
A little bit darker in the shadow. I mean, really, really subtle. And we got this lavender over here. And the question is, can I make that with my blue, my ultramarine blue and cad red? Because it's not an extremely, might have to use some magenta in that. Let's see. Well, I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting something like this. Whoops, like this. It's a little on the neutral side for this color. So I'm gonna kick it up with a little bit of magenta. Kick up the saturation here. A little bit of magenta. That's almost right. Let's see if I... Maybe a little touch bluer than that. So. It's right in there somewhere. All right, and then we got some shadows on the objects. Very light down in here, there, and here. Inside here. Oh, that, that came out really violet. A little grayer than that. Inside here too. One, one little thing I wanted to notice is that, wow, he, he brings the center over here. Aha. Uh -huh. And then pulls it. So it's important to make this shadow on here nice and light. And the background, you know, just a little bit darker. And it just kind of fades it. Just use the wet brush. Maybe even um, take some white on the base here and pull it up into, we may end up doing something like that for some of these. Actually pulling the white up into the violet. Oh boy, what a steady. Just, I don't know, probably one of the most sensitive painters I've ever seen.
Okay. You wanted to take a photo? Let me make that bigger. Here, let me make it a little bit bigger. That too big. What food in there? Barely. Okay. What a nice uh, study. I mean, that study body color. Oh, thank you. Well, we got time. We got time. Okay. Now, okay. You guys got it? Okay. I'm going on a hotter, a hot press. You don't have to, I mean, cold press would be fine. I'm not, it, and I won't, I probably won't pull up on me very much because I'm going to use some white in the paint, so. Um, and I'm working on this hot press board, so it, will dry. I don't need to really tack down the corners. I mean, the whole, I don't need to put tape on the whole thing because it's not going to warp on me. This stuff is pretty tough stuff. Okay, Mr. Morandi, teach me something, right? He's already taught me something. Okay. What did he teach you? I knew you were going to say that. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was, someone's going to ask me. Someone's going to ask me. It's probably George. <laughs> uh, uh, play, be very aware of, of everything, really. Wow. I'm sitting there going, we've got to be aware of your color, value, shapes. Um, very aware of things like how much to overlap to get it to feel like it's overlapped, but it's still kind of tangent. He just teeters everything on the edge. It's an interesting guy. <laughs> All right. I'm just gonna start it here in the center. Are we? I've got to make sure we're muted. Okay, I got you. And I'm just, sometimes when you're doing something symmetrical, it's good to draw a straight line down the center. All right, it's about that big before it starts curving. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll just kind of come back and I'll just block everything out first. Like, let's say this comes to about to there, to there, and then to there and to there.
So it's kind of blocked out. Let me zoom in on this. Because now I can come in and say, okay, so this is about that wide. And then I can just round this off based on my little kind of block in. This is rounder on the bottom. And this. So I have I have the peak of it right around there. That's that's good to know. Just you know, just so you don't go like this, you know. <laughs> like I do all the time. Anyway, I find this just basing everything off a of center line pretty helpful. And you can do that with anything symmetrical, it doesn't matter what it is. In my Huntington Library class, we did a waterfall, I mean, a, a fountain. And started off that way. This is really, and okay. And then right in front of it, we have another, we have this cup. It starts around there. It's about that wide. Again, maybe just block the cup out first. Maybe just block everything out first. Let's just do that before we get into too much. You know, there's a little bit of a taper in there. I think maybe it should be tapered. All right. This one again. Um, you know, if the top of this is here, this is about up here. And it just barely comes over the edge. You know, it might seem like he's just not even aware of that. He's so aware of that. Just blocking things out here. Remember this this space in between the vase and the broken. I don't know, we'll call it a flower container or something. It's about that far. I go just a little bit higher than that. And this puts the corner off. Oh, this red is really close to the top. All right. 
Make sure to give yourself a little white lip. See, there's a little lip to this. A little white there on the very edge. On, on all of these cups and things, saucers, whatever you call them. Um, yeah. So, so this one's really thin. See, it just kind of comes up like goes like that. Whereas this one has a thickness to it. See, so case that little white highlight there. I mean, it might, like I say, it might seem a little picky, and everything is picky in this. Bro. Yeah. I was noticing all four of the objects have vertical like lines whereas that uh, broken object doesn't have the vertical lines in it this one this one this one yeah and this one too yeah it it i don't know maybe it's... yeah maybe, what, maybe what just saying? happened or maybe well i'm sure he's aware of it <laughs> yeah Pattern, he's probably talking about pattern somehow. But from what the lady said, he used these objects over and over again. They were yeah. part of his collection. You could see that, yeah. I mean, I think we were looking at the actual objects, probably some of these objects. I, I didn't really get a good chance to. Yeah, I saw the vase in the first video wow. when we were filming the shelves yeah yeah the exact phase in this painting wow and especially if you've done a copy like this to see and you know how i what what i don't know what year it was but let's say it was 1915 or something well this one was 49 you had it written, oh 40 written, oh, okay written when uh when you sent the picture was that a was that a peacock from your house? I thought I just heard a peacock. George lives right by the uh, arboretum. I have a question, Brian. Yeah. Um, when we were watching the video and one of the paintings she was talking about with two like cylinder cylindrical yeah <laughs> objects on the sides and then something else anyway she said this might have been like to represent two guards because of the um war and everything and wow. i remember in art history class you got that a lot you know interpretations are those based on anything or is she just making that up? You know, this might have been two guards. Yeah, I, you know, oftentimes I think they're just making it up. But unless unless they say, I read uh, somewhere that this was what they were doing. This is what he was after. So this is the representation. I, I, I just take it as a, okay, that's your opinion. That's nice. Sounds a little. Okay, thanks. Because that's what yes. I didn't like about art history. I was looking at the art and they would make all these things up to yeah, me. I know. You know. Yeah. I'm just looking at the art anyway. Thank you. No, I, I feel the same way. And so, so much of it's irrelevant. I mean, they go on and on about, I, I don't know if it's irrelevant, but. Um, um, I don't know about things that uh, I, would, I would just fall asleep. You know, it's not really art. You almost want to say, excuse me, uh, can I ditch the class? Because I'm an artist and nothing you're saying is interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I remember thinking, just leave the lot art alone. You know, it's just yeah. pretty and beautiful, and I want to look at it. I mean, here I was at Riverside City College, and it was just sitting in a dark room, memorizing names and dates, and they'd go on about obscure little things that I just. So I got, I don't know what my grade was. It was horrible. And I just did, wasn't a person that got horrible grades, but some, something about art, I, I just had an attitude about art. <laughs> and then when I got to Art Center, I am sitting under this, you know, a curator from the Prague Museum. She's, you know, just hailed as this great, I mean, in, in certain circles, she's real. I mean, you go to, a, like we went to LACMA, we go to Norton Simon, um, people would want to know. They weren't even in the class. They weren't even at art center. They'd want to know when she was lecturing, so they could so they could come and watch her. These are art historians and just all kinds of people. And she'd have this crowds of people. She was a little lady. She was like four foot ten or something, and and she had this huge voice, and and uh, it was just really cool. And I got to be her assistant and I, I got nothing but straight A's in her class. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it just takes, I always say the same thing about math. I, you know, I, I thought math was okay, but I, gosh, again, I had this algebra teacher sitting in a dark room, watching slides. He'd be working out problems and I'm just going, you know, and, and then we had, um, well, I had perspective. I had two years of perspective in my in my other class, in my uh, art class, and then I had geometry, which I really excelled in. I don't know. It's, I know it's not always the teacher's fault to make it entertaining, but gosh, throw me a bone here, guys. Okay, <clears throat> so. And artists tend artists just tend to be a little opinionated and and uh, independent. Anyway, okay. So I'm going to make that green gray. I'm going to go with the ultramarine blue, lemon yellow, a little bit of red, and I'm adding white to it. Uh, cat cat red, and I'm adding white. Make sure you make plenty too. Get this. Can you repeat those colors, please? Sure. Okay, lemon yellow, cadmium red, and ultramarine blue. That's the color. Okay, I just need to add white. And I'm just gonna pull that off to the side. I'm adding white to it. So if you're working transparently, might be a little bit different. Now, hold on a second. Let me hit this with the hair dryer because sometimes these, these colors dry so dark. All right, I knew it. Add more white to that color. Okay, let's, yeah, that's what I want. Because I know it's gonna dry darker. Okay. Maybe I should have taped it off, huh? Yeah, I like the irregular edges.
you know, I did not completely did not understand Mirandi in the beginning, though. He re really. Um, shall I say, took me for a ride or something. <laughs> I don't know. It is so simple. And I was trained to do these very complicated things. But sometimes the simplicity is just where it's at. I'm going to go ahead and pull my strokes horizontally because I'm sure that means something to him. <laughs> And then over here, very similar. I'm just going to add more white. Let's hope that's not too much. And I'll do some blending. Got a little bit more yellow in that. Ooh, it's, it's it's just a little bit. A little bit darker on here. See so it goes from the, the wall to the ground here and the ground's a little bit darker. And that's just a shift in the uh, plane. Basically just trying to tell you, hey, there's a little shift here. And I noticed everything. Covered first. And then we'll just again with the horizontal strokes. He does go uh, up and down here. Interesting. Just a little bit darker on the ground. It's going to be a very similar color in all these shadows here, too, to this here. So I'm just going to go ahead and put those down. Maybe a little bigger, bigger than they are. That way, when I come back with the light around them, I can play with the edges. Look how he wraps this one. He goes all around the side with this, all the way over there. <laughs> What's he thinking? Maybe he, he, you know, he probably needed separation in there. And so he, he did what the painting called for. This is a painter who paints 
for what the painting needs. He's not controlled by reality. He, he uses reality. You know, not a slave to what he's looking at at all. Completely the other way around. He, he just... He takes what's there. And he's constantly manipulating everything to work for him. And everybody's got, you know, it's funny. I've talked to artists <clears throat> where, oh, I can't remember this one artist, Start Center. Uh, he couldn't see how how everybody didn't see how he was right about everything. And I mean everything. It was weird. I, I wanted to say, are you, were you raised an only child or something? Or... <laughs> It was just weird. I, I thought, you do realize other people have different points of view and all this. What a, what a dude. But artists can, you know, art. We're just people. When you know, one thing I do, I do see though with a lot of talented artists is they they you know they grow up with so many people complimenting them and they they they, they get a complex you know but i remember just he would he would say well you know that 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 is not the right way to do things this is the right way to do things I'm like well there's a lot right a lot of right ways to do things Anyway, it was interesting. Probably because I saw a lot of me in him. <laughs> Whoops. I mean. A little bit darker. Yeah, see how he hits it a really, little bit darker right under there. Right under there. Just and I put that line there. I'm gonna fade it back up in a all that. It looks awfully blue. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll tell you the rest of the story <laughs> since it's been over for a long, long time. So we went out in the halls and had it out. No, I'm just joking. Um, we, uh, I'm just sitting in my office as a, when I was an art director once, and here he shows up with his portfolio trying to get work. And I'm like, my jaw just about hit the ground. Because I knew I was seeing artists that morning to, to hire for a job, but I didn't know it was him. I, I didn't recognize his name. So that was awkward. <laughs> How do you say... You're probably quite capable of doing this work, but your personality is not going to work here. There we go. You know, art directors say that. <laughs> I'll keep your portfolio on hand. Thank you. <laughs> You know, he's the kind of artist that I would hire uh, only to do like specific things, something to where he didn't have to interact with people. 
you're probably you're quite a genius though you know i didn't need anyone that good <clears throat> One day, one day I'm going to be saying that and someone's going to go, excuse me, uh, Robert. Oh, oh, yes, yes. Hi. Uh, I was that person, Robert. <laughs> no, no, I mean, literally, that was me. Oh. Get your own classes. Turn it. Okay. All right, so so I'm just coming around these shadows here, and the edges are very important to him. I mean, I think everything is really important. I because you know why? Because I've I've worked with teachers that did work similar. Well, Vern Wilson, of course. Vern was just oh my gosh, he would absolutely agonize about some things that you just wouldn't even give a second thought to like why and you're like because of this and you're kind of going okay well i'm sorry i don't get it yet but i will i'll try and and then you know years later you finally get it and you're kind of like wow he was trying to tell me something you know i'm gonna get this this is drying a little yellow on me. I want to get that brighter. Yellow in that. I'm hoping that dries. Yeah. Oh boy, it is. Oh, was I right on the first try? You know, I'm thinking this is going to dry right though. And so what you can do is just take, maybe just take a damp brush and just buzz these edges a little bit. See, I'm a little fuzzy out here. So right next to the object, see how it gets real sharp? And as you get further away from the object, it gets more fuzzy. That's just classical painting. Academics 101. It's turning a little bit yellower now. I think if I zoom out, it yellows up a little bit more. Come on, oh, dynamically different. How that dries.
<clears throat> I'm noticing all the light, uh, all, all the whites, the light white stuff. It's not just white, it has yellow in it. You see that? Yellows and kind of pinks in the light. Wow. But it's very, very, very subtle. What isn't subtle here? Let's see. So I'm going to. Yeah. Well, one of the commentators made the comment that he spent more time setting up the composition than really painting. I guess all his paints were already set up and he. And if he done, it did the object so many times, he knew what colors he liked to depict them. Right. Yeah. It was probably more, he's, he's more about the setup than he was about the execution. Yeah. And that's just, again, that's another person's point of view. I, I, I don't know. It all matters. <clears throat> As I can tell by the way they were painted, they're not, these aren't just done very, very, very quickly. They don't have that brushy flair of a sergeant who would whip, whip, whip a painting out in 15 minutes or something. It's more of a, right, it's someone, one of the other ladies, I think she said, uh, they're contemplative. That's a good term. Yeah. Okay, let's see now. I'm going to get into this sort of violet-esque. You know, I'm wondering if he, he made this one more violet because of the teacup being violet. Maybe some of that color got up into it. Hmm. You'd think if that was the case, you would have put some more in it here. All right. So if you make a lavender color out of um, ultramarine blue and magenta and white, if you want. Then gray it with a little bit of yellow. Keeping a little bit of yellow in my white here and just breaking down this edge. Mm -hmm. 
simplifying this edge here. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing a lot of the same, a little bit duller, a little cooler shadow in here. Maybe a little bit more, yeah, a little bit of blue in that. All right, in here. Oftentimes when I do these shadows, I'll make them, I'll, I'll bring them way into the light, knowing that I'm going to pull the light right back into them. So if I'll take it too far. That way when I pull the light back over it, it overlaps very nicely. I'll go a little bit darker. I'll go for the colors. So the yellow, very yellowy light. blue and I'm just using ultramarine blue and white um, if that's too colorful of a blue then add a little bit of um, <clears throat> lemon yellow and cat red which will make you an orange a little bit of orange in that should gray a little bit. And then I need to go lighter. Wow.
a little bit warmer gray right in between the two. And here, uh, I think I'll wait on that red because I want to model the light first. So when I say modeling the light, see right now I just chunked in some shadow and it, and then there's the light. Modeling would be the blending in between and, and um, what do they call it? Um, just just some people call it rendering. Detailing it out. I'd rather do that before I hit the, the red in there. <clears throat> but first I want to do this. Get this magenta color. Ultramarine blue, magenta. If that gets too colorful. Let's add some white to it. I could always add a little bit of lemon yellow and that, that will tend to gray it. I see that color in it, but a little darker first. To blue, I knew it. To red, I think it's looking pretty good. I should put the shadow on there first. <clears throat> And then up and underneath, all this goes in shadow because the light comes from above and it's at a tapered angle. So under all this goes into shadow and then it casts a little bit of a shadow over all this in the back. You know, I'll just soften this edge as it goes into goes into shadow. Around her, huh? And
And while those are drying up, I'll come into the shadows in here. Oh boy, look like it was darker than that. <clears throat> Hold on. It just dries darker, quite a bit darker. Can we get lighter?
We can just really soften these edges. That's what I mean. He didn't just really quickly do this painting because the edges are too uh, And it's not that it, it's it's this incredible rendering or anything. It's it's more of you can just see the attention and probably agonized over quite a bit of it. These artists like this, the everything, you know, just, just like an edge, like the little dark behind here. They'll agonize over that. They'll take it out, they'll put it back in, they'll take it out. means everything. And make it a little bit redder, a little bit lighter. I just added yellow, um, lemon yellow, a little bit more red. And, and unfortunately, you got to add a little white to it sometimes to get it lighter. And that can desaturate your color. Maybe not that dark.
A little bit of dark at the base of things. Just to set things down a little bit. Oh, this isn't too dark. You know, like the color when it's far away. When I, when I crop into it, it washes it all out. Huh. It's technology. You know, it's warmer. It's weird. That's closer to the color I'm actually painting, but this is really washed out. All right. All right. What have we got? Everybody. Um, well, you know, I just thought of something. I, I just. Uh, well, I'll be posting the flyers up for next term. It's actually, I went up here, um, like the middle of, it's the 18th, I think, the week of the 18th of March. 
but what was I going to say? Oh, um, I've decided to get rid of PayPal. Just, I'm so, they just keep changing their rules and uh, charging, the, upping their fees and just getting so sick of their fees. I, I, I just wonder, why, why do I even, like, probably three quarters of the people mail me checks anyway, so. Um, so I'm just going to do checks. Or Zelle, if you like Zelle. That's fine. For next time. Okay, what do we got? Yeah. Let's, um, how about 10 minutes, okay? See you in 10 minutes. Bob, I have a question on Zelle. Oh, do I just send yeah. it to your email address? On Zelle? Uh, uh -huh. I think they give you the option of sending it to your phone number or the email address. Right. Do you want the email? Either one. Okay. Uh, yeah, do you? Yeah, I just did it for my brother. He's in Mexico. I had to send him some money. So um, I just, I know I can use it um, email. Just okay, yeah. Double Email's good. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. Sure. If All you right. want, yeah. If you, if you want us to use the phone number, I don't have it. Phone number? Um, well, you could just use my email address. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. I, I like Zell, so I'll use that. Yeah, thanks. I like it too. All right, 10 minutes.
Okay. <clears throat> Henry, you went to, it, it was too easy for you. You had to, you had to jazz it up a little bit, huh? <laughs> a live flower on my dining table. I took oh. a picture. I, I, I just, uh, um, placed inside the vase. I <laughs> think it would be nice. But it changed the light lighting condition. It's backlit uh, from the photo reference, if you could see yeah, on my uh, uh, video. Another one? Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, I, I didn't send you the reference, but it, the okay. reference uh, is the upper portion of the, the painting, including the blinds. So the light yeah. comes from behind instead of from the left. So I had to change the reflection or the cast shadow. Mm, yep. The two chairs are actually my uh, uh, home furniture, <laughs> and uh, also the curtain on top of the blinds. That's all my uh, yeah, the window uh, behind. So I try to combine the uh, still life uh, from the uh, Moradis uh, with my, well, my home. One one thing I'd like to point out that I'm seeing uh -huh. is. So, one thing, okay, so we have this sort of angle in the back, and then right below it, we've got this all this symmetry. I see. And yet, I did not even see it in the beginning <laughs> because you offset it with the chairs and the objects, and then draping this down over here off to the side instead of doing it, you know, like, you could have done it, like, right in the center, and that would may, maybe made it look too symmetrical. So. The way you're offsetting it with all this asymmetry is a very nicely balanced piece. Oh, thank you for, for I mean, that. Uh, you know, I mean, you that's tricky. That, that's a Yeah, it, I, I think it's a very I, I was thinking to uh, do this as a color study, but uh, I don't have time to actually do it on the uh, formal uh -huh. surface. Yeah, it's uh, on notebook, uh, mixed media pa uh, paper. Yeah, I love these reflections too. This one right here looks wow. I have to I imagine know. that. But I do have a little okay. reference from the ways that on the table, uh, you know, on the picture, if, if you can see. Um, it's basically a reflection instead of the cast shadow, I think. Right, right. Because yours is being backlit, right, yeah. Yeah. And not, not a, it's not a strong lighting, so you're not really getting too much. No. More of a cast shadow. Oh. It's a good work, Henry. Oh, well, thank you, George. <laughs> thank you. you have a shiny dining room table, huh? Yeah, it's uh, the uh, the actually those is called a knock. Uh, what uh, it's a, like a, a pr protruding from the walls a little bit. So that's why giving me an angle on the corners and the the drapery is uh, is not a uh, um, parallel to the to the table. Yeah. It, it mm -hmm. has a little perspective because the the t the window part is uh, uh, protruding from the the alignment of that wall. Yeah. Uh huh. So yeah. it's actually going. Back yeah, going going uh, out a little bit, going round. Yeah, the table. Yeah. yeah. So that's is, given, is yeah. it round? No, it's uh, some uh, <laughs> three. It's just kind of going back and then coming out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just like like that. Right. Right, that, that's the side, exactly. It's a uh, 45 degree, and then uh, the front is uh, parallel to the table. Yes, that's why I give you. But because this is almost at your eye level, then it, it feels almost flat. That's what yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. I, I take the picture of uh, putting the, the phone on the table. So it's about the table. Uh, yeah, you're right. It's very low um, yeah. eye level. And I love this juxtaposition. You've got the small part of the flowers over here, the larger part over here, and then you have the larger part of this over here, which, which this is what I was talking about. Um, you, you've got symmetry, and then you're, yeah. you're taking all of these other things and positioning them to offset it, and it works. It works very fun. Very, yeah, I didn't a, even notice it was <laughs> symmetrical until I was sitting here. I put it together. I'm like, hey. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels also on the uh, blinds. It's kind of hard to. Uh, I I didn't really try to uh, match the exact uh, look. Just got with like abstract. Yeah. yeah. 
simplify uh, uh, Henry, Henry, this is great, but what what do you think of uh, having just one chair? Oh, just a, uh, just yeah. a left one? Yeah, so I... Because <laughs> the pattern goes down to the right. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, I think that's... What the, do you think? Um, I, I, I didn't have the right chair at the first, but uh, there's two chairs actually in the reference photos. <laughs> I just kind of influenced my judgment. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, I, I just wonder how, how it's going to be if it's just one, um, one was, chair. If or just maybe the left one. The, leave the left one. The left one should be there, I think. Yes, it, yeah. I think so. The, the right one, it's optional. Yeah, I agree with you. Because that part... It, I didn't have a, um, a, a mature. Yeah, um, I well, so. I'm not sure, but uh, I yeah. I just thought maybe to. Yeah, it could be kind of a, to make it unbalanced to make to make balance. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, kind of competing with the other right. two. Right, it's a, like uh, two host and guest. <laughs> yeah, coming to. I don't know. But yeah, that's a that's a that's a hard uh, call. Yeah. Thank you for for the question. I don't have an answer. That's a, I think uh, Rob is doing something to maybe another. I'm just putting a little drapery over the other one. Yeah, something to hide that or soften out. We can yeah. just trim it off. I think, but then it will you'll have like two chairs cut off by the frame. That's another. You thing see I what use. you see, everybody. This is what I love. I love that we're agonizing over this stuff because you know what? That's how you get better. You start thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. But that's but I think really it looks strange. Like a, yes. I think it looks like a very realistic setting with those two chairs there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's right. It's mm -hmm. very yeah, realistic. I I can feel this room. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, on you could the, also make the complete chair on the left and the partial chair on the right. Yeah, that. that yeah, 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 you, yeah. If you yeah, if you look at the <laughs> if you look I at my, my uh, variations, but it's good work. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah, I I think uh, on the original reference, if you could see, uh, there's a, a little um, card. Uh, Art artboard on the table that could be a, another object uh, hiding some of the chair. It's uh, right mm -hmm. on the reference, around, on the reference picture here. You can see. Uh, anyway, so I'm sorry. I'm just drawing a silhouette of Bigfoot. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, what I needed. Yeah. Another on, thing is uh, we can uh, subdue the color intensity. Okay. The uh, maybe I just glaze with a, a layer of a, a light, uh, uh, you know, very pale blue gray, just to mute it into the background. I think that will help because the color of the the second chair in question is too strong. So that kind of uh, yeah, definitely I can do that to do sub subdue the color to mute the color. Yeah. Well, fantastic exchange, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you. I, uh, Thank you, everybody. I like that you think about it, that you're putting that much into it. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, it's just, you. Th when you think about things this much, you're going to get better. And so much of it's mental, psychological. I can't tell you how much painting is psychological. Wow. OK, thank you. Thank you for the class. That was a good one, huh? Um, Teresa, I mean, Terry, excuse me.